Escaping the Laboratory The Rodent Experiments of John B. Calhoun and Their Cultural Influence by Edmund Ramsden and John Adams Abstract In John B. Calhoun's early crowding experiments, rats were supplied with everything they needed except space. The result was a population boom followed by such severe psychological disruption that the animals died off to extinction. The take-home message was that crowding resulted in pathological behavior, in rats, and by extension, in humans. For those pessimistic about Earth's carrying capacity, the macabre spectacle of this behavioral sink was a compelling symbol of the problems awaiting overpopulation. Calhoun's work enjoyed considerable popular success. But cultural influence can run both ways. In this paper, we look at how the cultural impact of Calhoun's experiments resulted in a simplified, popular version of his work coming to overshadow the more nuanced and positive message he wanted to spread, and how his professional reputation was affected by this popular success. Introduction in 1947, John B. Calhoun's neighbor agreed to let him build a rat enclosure on disused woodland behind his house in Townsend, Maryland. Calhoun would later reflect that his neighbor probably expected a few hutches, perhaps a small run. What Calhoun built was a quarter-acre pen, what he called a rat city, in which he seated with five pregnant females. Calhoun calculated that the habitat was sufficient to accommodate as many as 5,000 rats. Instead, the population leveled off at 150, and throughout the two years Calhoun kept watch, never exceeded 200. That the predicted maximum was never reached ought to come as no surprise. 5,000 rats would be tight indeed. A quarter acre is little over 1,000 square meters, meaning each rat would have to itself an area of only about 2,000 square centimeters, roughly the size of an individual laboratory cage. Be that as it may, a population of only 150 seemed surprisingly low. What had happened? Employed in the Laboratory of Psychology of the National Institute of Mental Health from 1954, Calhoun repeated the experiment in specially constructed rodent universes. Room-sized pens, which could be viewed from the attic above via windows cut through the ceiling. Using a variety of strains of rats and mice, he once more provided his populations with food, bedding, and shelter. With no predators and with exposure to disease kept at a minimum, Calhoun described his experimental universes as rat utopia or mouse paradise. With all their visible needs met, the animals bred rapidly. The only restriction Calhoun imposed on his population was of space. And as the population grew, this became increasingly problematic. As the pins heaved with animals, one of his assistants described rodent utopia as having become hell. Marsden, 1972. Dominant males became aggressive, some moving in groups, attacking females and the young. Mating behaviors were disrupted. Some became exclusively homosexual. Others became pansexual and hypersexual, attempting to mount any rat they encountered. Mothers neglected their infants, first failing to construct proper nests, and then carelessly abandoning and even attacking their pups. In certain sections of the pens, infant mortality rose as high as 96%. The dead cannibalized by adults. Subordinate animals withdrew psychologically, surviving in a physical sense, but at an immense psychological cost. They were the majority in the later phases of growth. 
existing as a vacant, huddled mass in the center of the pins. Unable to breed, the population plummeted and did not recover. The crowded rodents had lost the ability to coexist harmoniously, even after the population numbers once again fell to low levels. At a certain density, they had ceased to act like rats and mice, and the change was permanent. Calhoun published the results of his early experiments with the rats at the National Institute for Mental Health in a 1962 edition of Scientific American. That paper, Population Density and Social Pathology, went on to be cited upwards of 150 times a year. It has since been included as one of 40 studies that changed psychology, joining papers by such figures as Freud, Pavlov, Milgram, Warshak, Skinner, and Watson. Hawk, 2004. Like Pavlov's dogs, or Skinner's pigeons, Calhoun's rats came to assume a near-iconic status as emblematic animals, exemplary of the ways in which behavioral experimentation at once marks and violates the human-animal distinction. The macabre spectacle of crowded, psychopathological rats and the available comparison with human life in the densely packed inner cities ensured the experiments were quickly adopted as scientific evidence of social decay. Referenced far outside of the fields of ecology and mental health, Calhoun's rats have, or certainly had, come to seem part of the common cultural stock, shorthand for the problems of urban crowding, just as Pavlov's dogs were for respondent conditioning. Along with their public popularity, the experiments played a critical role in the development of disciplines and research fields, so much so that sociologist and human ecologist Amos Howley, 1972, would remark that the extent of their influence was itself a curious phenomenon. Calhoun began his career as an animal ecologist. Born in Elkton, Tennessee, on the 11th of May, 1917, he recalled a childhood spent immersed in nature. Already a keen amateur naturalist, it was as a collector for the labs at the University of Virginia, Charlottesville, that he became known to the biology department from which he graduated in 1939. Later that year, Calhoun began postgraduate studies in zoology at Northwestern. A number of temporary appointments in biology faculties followed, and then, in 1946, Calhoun moved to the John Hopkins School of Hygiene and Public Health. Here, his formative training and the practical skills of trapping and collecting were put to use on the North American census of small mammals, a vast and ambitious project to record numbers and species which Calhoun was to coordinate until 1956. Now married, Calhoun would settle here in Maryland, and it was here that the first rat experiments took place. As part of a project looking at ways to control Baltimore's rodent population, two communities of Norway rats were studied, one in a row of backyards in Baltimore, and the other set out in Chesapeake Bay on Parsons Island. The contrast between natural and man-made settings would prove portentous. Templates for the Townsend enclosure built the following year and for much of his later work, Calhoun, 1949, 1950-1963-A. Calhoun's interest in the relation between space and numbers was shared by the U.S. Army, and in 1951, Calhoun continued his population studies at the Walter Reed Military Academy in Bethesda, Maryland. Calhoun's work at Walter Reed had been supported by a grant from the National Institute of Mental Health, and, commencing 1954, he would move across the road to begin a full-time appointment with the Section on Perception at the Laboratory of Psychology, National Institute for Mental Health. Moving out into the fields above Bethesda, Calhoun first leased a barn from a farmer where he built the first of his rodent universes. Eventually, he is settled in Building 112 in an annex to the National Institute of Mental Health initially allowed considerable latitude, 
he would remain here for most of his career, constructing ever more elaborate universes, ever more ambitious research cycles. Meanwhile, as word of the experiments spread, his work became increasingly popular. Although Calhoun would work at the National Institute for Mental Health for over three decades, it was during this first period, 1954 to 1962, that much of what he would later be remembered for would happen. This early research received a huge amount of attention, both publicly and professionally. We pursue these issues in the first part of this essay, examining how Calhoun's approach, notably his blurring of the human-animal boundary, impacted upon the concerns of a generation, encouraging numerous behavioral scientists to enter into the study of crowding among human beings. What made the National Institute of Mental Health Experiments uniquely influential, however, was not only Calhoun's decision to focus on behavioral rather than physical pathology, vice as opposed to misery, the more common of Malthusian concerns, but also his careful use of language. The transition from lab notes to Scientific American to the pages of newspapers and novels required relatively little translation. Constructing a typology of pathological crowding behaviors, he gives the group's names immediately resonant with human types. Most successful of all, the tendency to congregate in dense, huddled knots of squalor and violence, he called the behavioral sink. The mobility of Calhoun's findings was also aided by his preferred experimental organism, the rat, a creature synonymous with urban and, indeed, moral degeneration. This paper will explain how the popularity of his experiments came to impact upon his later research and reputation as a scientist. The public image of what Calhoun had achieved was largely negative, concerned with the macabre spectacle of the behavioral sink, with the horror story of the crowd, and disseminated through popularization, journalism, science fiction, and even comic books. We shall see that this success in translating his work to broader audiences had serious repercussions for its interpretation among behavioral scientists concerned with the modern human condition. For as Calhoun's rodents moved beyond the boundaries of the National Institute for Mental Health and behavioral ecology more generally, escaping into the broader social world and into the popular imagination, they also escaped from his control. While, professionally, his work became a seemingly obligatory touchstone reference for a wide number of fields ranging from architecture to zoology, the numerous simplistic and sensational popular accounts of Calhoun's work resulted in his association with an unduly pessimistic and cataclysmic vision of man's future in a crowded world, a vision that many chose to counter. To his growing frustration and dismay, Few drew upon his later research, dedicated to ameliorating the ill effects of crowding. Through the effective design of space, he attempted to develop more collaborative and intelligent rodent communities, capable of withstanding greater degrees of density. For Calhoun, contrary to many interpretations, population growth was not inherently bad, and humanity was not destined to destroy itself. Finally, the paper will explore how, as he struggled to have his message understood and acted upon, the scientific, artistic, and popular imaginations began to fuse. Having long been happy to draw inspiration from writers such as H. G. Wells and George Orwell, he increasingly saw his rodent laboratories as providing evidence for the alternative futures these authors imagined. Humanity must undergo a conceptual and compassionate revolution or else, like his rodents, descend to stagnation and death. He mapped the development of his rodent populations, of human cultural evolution, and his own career onto one another. Just as subordinate rats and mice struggled to find more creative solutions to the problems of increased density, as opposed to their aggressive and conservative superiors, he, like other creative thinkers, had also struggled professionally,
existing on the boundary between the social and the biological sciences, meant that all too often he existed on the periphery of both. His use of cultural reference to promote a more positive vision of humanity's future in a crowded world met with much less success. With his failure to secure the necessary institutional support to complete his project in the 1980s, Calhoun feared that the pessimistic Orwellian future, of which he had been all too readily aligned, would become a reality.